So today we'll be discussing um, biblical interpretation. And uh, remember, uh, we were supposed to look at pitfalls, but I deliberately had to jump pitfalls because I felt we had covered some things on pitfalls. So let's just go straight to biblical interpretation um, at its core, right? So if you know, uh, this passage is very, 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 very common. Second Timothy chapter three from verse 16 to 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, right? We quote this passage several, several times even though sometimes might be out of context. But the fact that it is true that all scripture, and the Bible is very specific there, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for, first of all, doctrine. And then for reproof. Many times we don't like that second part, right? Reproof. Many of us don't like it, right? But the scripture is given for reproof. And when you hear a proof, it means you need to proof again, right? It means that the person might have been going out of line and you need to reproof that person. And it's also for correction. Again, many of us don't like that word correction. We see correction as insult. We see correction, especially when it is coming from people who are slightly younger, right? I've, I've been in, in, in forums where the men of God see it as criminal for them to sit down under somebody they are pastoring and hear the word. They would rather wait outside and when the person has finished, they will now come in and even summarize. Or if they are sitting down, they must come out to summarize the child. They must just say something. They can't just have the person finish and then let's share the grace and go. No, they must come and say something like, look, to conclude what this person says, as if the person is not big enough to talk. Like they are the authority of anointing. Right? And I keep saying, if you check the fivefold gospel, there was no uh, ministry. There's no place we are pastor, for instance, the, in, the term that we use um, that became that started becoming popular uh, since 1904. Um, that term pastor be started becoming very, very popular then, um, especially after the Azusa Street revival. It doesn't mean that that person is has authority over everybody. And, and so when I look at people like Brother Billy, and some other people who have ministries but are still members of a particular church. So you can imagine if Brother Billy is attending a church, he isn't a pastor, he doesn't own a church, he owns a ministry where he does some work. So it means on Sunday he goes somewhere and somebody pastors him, and the pastor sits down, Brother Billy teaches him how to, how to pastor. Then Brother Billy and the pastor will sit down when they go for um, and the evangelist will go and win souls and bring them for the pastor and the teacher to teach. And the pastor will teach the we pastor the teacher and the teacher will teach the pastor. You know that is what Paul was talking about in, in, in Romans chapter one. He said, "I long to come to you that there will, there will be a mutual benefit um, benefiting from our spiritual gifts, right?" But people don't like reproof; they don't like correction. Yet, if you check what the scripture is given for. Most of the words there are strong words that people don't like. First of all, is doctrine. People can banter over doctrine. You know, people don't mind. People, people try. When you talk about doctrine, what comes to mind most times is trying people trying to prove their knowledge. But when it comes to reproof, is saying as if you are wrong somewhere. When it comes to correction, it's obviously that you are wrong. Then when it comes for to instruction, people don't like direction. <laughs> people like to be the leader, not to be led. Yet, the essence of the whole Bible at the, at the end of everything is that these things must happen. In fact, if you've been with us two years ago when we started looking at um, apologetics in proper, we, we try to prove that the Christian canon has closed. There will not be any addition to the Bible again. No new book will be added to the Bible. The canon had closed. Right? It means if God wanted to say anything to us, he has said it already. There is no new revelation that supersedes the Bible. Any revelation that supersedes the Bible is from the devil. That is the Christian belief. We believe that our, our canon has closed. There's not going to be any addition to it. So it's not, many of us 
have lived well over 20. Somebody just did uh, 20, 20, 20 something. Some people are doing 30 something. Some people are coming. Many of us are trusting God to live above 70, above 80. Will, is it, it, does it make sense that we spend ample time to actually understand this book mm -hmm. if it is the complete revelation of God for us that he thinks we need? Right? So we took time and we looked at observation. Right? We said we said that inductive Bible study has three stages. Observation, interpretation, and then application. And we took time to say observation could be many. There are many observations, but there is only one interpretation. There are many observations, but there can be only one interpretation. And the way to get that interpretation is ask observation questions properly. And what you are trying to answer when you when you ask your observation questions is you are trying to understand what do what does the passage mean to the original writer and how will it have been understood by the original receiver right the person who wrote that passage that bible the person who wrote that letter when paul wrote to timothy there was something in his mind that he wanted to address how can I find that thing that Paul wants to address? When Timothy received the letter, how would he have perceived the letter? Right? That is what we want to understand from observation and interpretation. Thereafter, we can now look at application. Right? And there are various levels of application. So I will just summarize them here. Uh, we'll read them and they'll move on. We'll start taking them one by one. The first one is the historic application. It is where a, a narrative or instruction is directed towards historic entities and those historic entities alone. Jonah, go and build an ark. It will be stupid for Sister Day will see to wake up now and start building an ark simply because in her morning devotion, she read in the book of Genesis where Jonah built an ark. And anything the Bible says, I must do. So me to go and build an ark. A very stupid and foolish of us to do, right? It is historic, it's a narrative of instru or instruction directed towards historic entities and historic entities we know. She cannot. Nothing more, right? Then we have the prophetic application. The prophetic application is future historic application. Right? It's a future historic application. It's a something pointing to the future. And when that future comes and goes, that thing will become historic. Right? Today, the next five minutes is the future. In 10 minutes' time, next five minutes would have been history. Right? So is an indication of events that will come to pass in the future. This could be prophecy and fulfillment, or they could be patterns. So prophecy in the Bible is not just that it is saying specifically what will happen, and, I, and my son was drawn out of Egypt, and I heard some people crying for their children, which was symbolic of when, you know, um, Herod killed some children, you know, or that that is prophetic, but there are some that could be a pattern in the likeness of Joseph going into the pit, Jesus dying, Joseph being lifted up, Jesus exalted, God asking um, 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 Abraham, go and kill thy son, God giving his only begotten son. On a mount, Jesus died on Mount Golgotha. Right? Those are patterns. Right? We'll get into them in details later on. And there are spiritual applications. These are narrative examples that illustrate a spiritual truth. Information that contains a devotional benefit, which may give peace, assurance, joy, or even righteous in indignation. This is the one that our present-day Christians are very, very used to. Again, I'm, I, I chose the word present-day Christians very, very carefully because if you've taken time to study church history, you discover that the way we do Christianity right now is pretty much different from the way Christianity was done just 150 years ago, before the Azusa Street Revival. 
right? Many things have changed. And of course, many things did change even when Rome adopted Christianity as the state religion. Now, there is doctrinal application. Remember um, Timothy, yeah, right? We have read that the, God, the, 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 the all scripture is given. Part of the thing there is for doctrine, right? A doctrinal application is a direct instruction regarding a policy. Is a direct instruction regarding a policy, principle, or procedure by which God operates, or by which Christians should operate, or regarding a truth that must be believed and kept. There are no shortcuts. It must be believed or kept. Whoever wants to see the Father must pass through Jesus. That is a doctrine of salvation. And it can be changed. You can't, you can't, you can't do, there is no two ways about the doctrine. There's only one way. So when we talk about doctrine, there is no going left or right. It's one way, right? Again, um, I can always drop the slides and we can go through them. But there is also the principal application. These are specific instructions. Get towards specific types of people in a certain culture it may not directly apply since circumstances can be vastly different. But the underlying principles can be extracted for contemporary application. Meaning that there are certain, when we read the Bible, especially, and I'm using this, choosing the word carefully, especially the Old Testament, we learn the types and the mannerism of God, but the, the, um, the, Issues that were addressed there may no longer be relevant to us, but we could learn some principles from it. For example, when God told the children of Israel to enter into the wilderness and they went and their shoe did not wear, neither did their clothes tear, it is specific for the children of Israel. But from that story, we can learn the principle like Paul later wrote to Timothy, that no man goes, was it Paul or, or in the book of James, that no man goes into war on his own account. God sent them here to provide for them. We can learn the principle of God. We can see uh, when God appeared to Haggai, uh, when he revealed himself as Belaroy, when the, 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 even though it was a castaway son, God could not allow that son to die of thirst. Right? So it is not talking to God, but from it, you can pick out a principle about God's personality inside. That is principle application. Then there is the moral application. Like when we read the book, I'll say, what is the moral of the story? That the morals of the story that modern day readers can glean from historic application. Like with Elisha and Naaman. One moral could be from that story could be to do what God instructs, even if you don't understand it at that time. It would be very, very foolish of anybody who is passing through leprosy. Like I learned that there is, um, is it cholera now rampant in, Niger in some parts of Nigeria. It would be very stupid for anybody who is passing through this now. The person is trying to go and locate one river and jump inside three times or seven times in the name of I'm going to get healed because I simply read that story in the book of maybe First Kings or Second Kings. Right? It is just the moral. After reading this thing, what can I learn from it? Obey God's instructions, even if you don't understand it. She can, and that is where it ends. Nothing concerned with water, nothing concerned with leprosy, nothing concerned with anything. Now, and there is the direct and practical application. This is straightforward instructions that the contemporary reader can and should directly obey. Can and should directly obey. So these are the type of applications we have when we read the Bible in the proper way. However, we must be aware of the tendency for nostalgia to turn into doctrine. Where we bring traditions and preferences um, and get them venerated and preached and practiced as doctrinal truth. We have to avoid that trap. Back away from your current scenario and see the bigger picture. What am I talking about here? When I talk with people of my generation and people slightly above my generation, what I hear is the old time religion. And when we say the old time religion, what are we trying to say? We, 
we we think back with nostalgia at those days we used to do this those days we used to do this no are those things you those things we're doing in those days are they biblical if they are not biblical I don't care what you did those days. It doesn't matter because the world keeps moving. Those days, you, I mean, I remember those days leaving Kaduna and going all the way to Abuja to school. When I get to school, I will write a letter to my parents that I have gotten to school. By the time they are receiving the letter, I am already writing another letter that I am broke. You know, my mom will not know whether I got, there was a particular day I came home, I was sick from school and I was sent home. But I had been falling sick frequently and my dad, when he saw me, didn't want to believe that I was sick. So he bundled me, gave me one small money and told me to go back to school. And as a young boy, I was hungry and he did that in anger. So I ate some food on the way. And then when I stopped, I was schooling in Kuali, Abuja. When I got to Guagualada, my transport and everything had finished. I had to trek from Guagualada to Kuali with malaria and typhoid in my body. And by the time I got to school, I collapsed and I was ill and they had to bring me back home. My father now apologized to me and said, look, I know you are really, really sick. But he was just like, why are you always sick? Eventually I had to leave the school and started schooling somewhere back home in Kaduna so that they can watch my health um, um, properly. You know, but what am I trying to bring out um, from that story? They don't know whether whether I've gotten home or not, whether I've gotten to school or not. Unlike this time that you use phone to be monitoring each other, I just left the bus stop. I just right. So there are many things that we think of nostalgia when when people people have this tendency that what they grew up with in their in their congregation, they see it as the standard for Christianity. And every other thing from every other denomination is wrong. The question is, why should you trust where you came from? Have you investigated? My dad converted from Islam to Christianity. And about 15 years ago, I put a pause to my pursuit of Christianity. And I read the Quran. The Quran is just about three quarter of the New Testament. I read the Quran about two or three times, right? And I was like, how can I trust that my father, even though I was a Christian, even though I had been an, uh, um, an ESCO in Nifes back in school, even though I had been whatever, I will just, for the sake of it, can you just investigate this religion you are in, in, into? Because you could have just been indoctrinated. Yes, I have passed, I've seen the, the, the move I've been in meetings where I prayed and people were slain in the spirit. Fine, but investigate. Because do you know why? People who follow Buddhism get slain. People who follow Ifa get slain. And they go through spasms, spiritual spasms, where they say on, 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 on um, imaginable words, unintelligible words, like we would normally call speaking in tongues. They do all those things too. So I went through investigation and nobody under the sun right now can prove to me that Christianity is not the only logical religion upon the face of the earth. Islam is far, far, far away from it. Very far. So far a fallacy to compare to Christianity. Even with Christianity in all of its flaws, surpasses Islam. Right, So there's that tendency that because you grew up from Baptist, because you grew up from Equa, because you grew up from cooking, you feel that what you were doing when you were growing is nostalgia. And you are trying to venerate. That is, you are trying to make that nostalgia become something spiritual that you preach it and practice it. And most people, when they do this, they will now find Bible passages to support why what they think is right is right. Remember, that is one big error in inductive Bible study. There is a big line between number one point, which observation and application. There is a big line before that, right? And 
I won't spend time explaining this because we've done it before. But I'll just summarize. You have to read the Bible like it doesn't concern you. Read the Bible like it does not concern you. Understand the context and the content under the background under which it was written. After you've done that, to understand the context and the content in its part, in its peculiar background, then you can now come to application. Application is always last. So when you are doing something as a Christian, you want to be able to look into the Bible and see a passage that tells you that what you are doing is right based on context and content. Which is why there was a time one band was reading WWJD, what will Jesus do? In context and content, the Bible, not your history, not what you know, not what Papa said, not what pastors said, because I can tell you many Papas and pastors miss it. If you've been following us for a while, you can agree with me the majority of what I'm saying here, many papas don't even know. They don't even know. They don't even know. It doesn't, it, I mean, this thing will look like Greek to them. Right? So, there's a big line. Before we jump into application, we must go through observation and interpretation properly, which is why the Bible even told us not many of us should be eager to be teachers. Bigger. When you teach, people take your words with authority and they run their life based on what you say. And you could have just told them nonsense. You could be sincerely telling them nonsense. But that doesn't change the fact that it is nonsense just because you are sincere about it. Nonsense is nonsense. No matter how you paint it with sincerity. Right? So before we proceed, there are some basic questions you need to ask before you go into observation. And the question is, where am I? So if you remember when we were doing um, um, sequencing of events, right? I didn't have the time because I felt there were, too, there were going to be too many jargons for, for us. Maybe as we, come, as we proceed in our discussion, we'll look at these things better. But you can see that um, you are here, red um, balloon. It's showing us where we are. We have the Old Testament. We have um, the birth of Jesus, um, John the Baptist, right, in JB. Then we have the death of Jesus Christ, which is the first rejection, public rejection of the Jews. All those places you see MMM, those are where the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus Christ came first of all for the Jews, right? He said, I came to my own and his own if you um, receive him. I was not talking about us Gentiles. <laughs> he was talking about the Jews, right? And they refused him. After they refused him the third time in Acts chapter 7, then we had in Acts chapter 8, the apostle to the Gentiles was now introduced, which is Paul, right? And then from then, they had only one time in, in uh, Acts chapter 23, which, which is actually a repeat of something that happened um, earlier, right? Then Acts ended, and then the church, we are in between. There has been 1,986 years of 2018, right? When this slide was made. After 2018, it was 1,986 years after the end of Acts of Apostles. So you and I are here. We are in between the end of Acts of Apostles and, right, the rapture of the saints and the return of Jesus, right, the second coming, when he's going to come for to rule for a thousand uh, a millennia year, right? We are in between. We have to know where we are. You need to know where you are in the scheme of things. The Bible is a doctrine that start is a book that started from creation and is talking about the destruction of the earth when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem. So it's a story that starts from the beginning and tells us the end and then now tells us a new beginning. You have to know where you are inside the whole story. If you don't know where you are inside the whole story, you will take a story that is meant for something and apply it to yourself and you refuse to cut your hair and have Dada and say Dada has been sanctification. And that era has ended. There is not like Nazarene again. You have to be able to understand where you are in the scheme of things. Now, the Bible also took time to tell us that there are three classes of people recognized in the New Testament. There are three classes of people recognized in the New Testament. 
And you need, you need to be able to ask yourself, which one are you? We, who am I? Remember, you have to be able to spot where am I in the whole story? When Adam sinned, in extension, when we all sinned, God began to uncover a story about how he was going to redeem us by himself. Back to himself, rather, by himself. He began to unveil it. And in the process of doing that, he picked somebody called Terah. Terah started a journey. He stopped halfway. His son, Abraham, or Abraham at that time, continued it. And outside from Abraham, he picked another person called Isaac. Then from Isaac, he picked Jacob. Then from Jacob, he picked, you know, until he got to Jesus, right? And from Jesus, something happened. Up until Acts chapter 10 or 13, it was all about the church. And then we now came in later on with the apostle to the Gentiles. So if we check here, there are three classes of people recognized in the New Testament. Which one are you? So if we check that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 36, he said, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Three classes. Actually, there are two classes of people which later can now be agamated to the third group. So we are either Jews nor Gentiles. And if I ask you right now, we are all Gentiles. You and I are Gentiles. At least the people here, I'm not sure anybody came from Israel. We are all Gentiles. Right? So there are three classes of people recognized in the New Testament. At which group or groups is the passage under consideration aimed? You must be able to ask that question. So when we see a lot of debate over whether should I tithe, whether should I give first fruit offering, whether should I do this, and people are quoting scriptures and counter scriptures, is because we don't even understand sequencing. God appeared in, to us in times and places, and there are dispensations. When you read about God in the dispensation of conscience, the only thing you can pick out from him some of his mannerisms, you can't take doctrinal things out of it. It's called dispensation of conscience or dispensation of the law is, um, is completely different from the dispensation of grace. It's completely different from the dispensation of grace. Right? And so you have to be careful where you pick your doctrinal elements from. As you proceed, you understand. And the advantage of this is that you live sweet Christian lives. You 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 enjoy you enjoy even your faults. You enjoy even your weakness. What I mean you enjoy it is that you, you accept this is who you are. And you don't need to go and brag in front of anybody. And you see, they'll say a man of God impregnated somebody and everybody is falling down. It's because we are still taking them beyond who they are. They are human beings like us, and they are under the dispensation of grace. Right? So let's proceed. So there are multiple key events and circumstances in the New Testament. Between which events or during which circumstances does the passage under consideration occur? Or at which time is it aimed? Who, who is it aimed at? You need to be able to ask that question. So there are many things that happen in, the, in what we call the New Testament. If you are here with us two weeks ago, remember I told us that the New Testament, really, the real New Testament which is an agreement, which is an attestation, which cannot come into place until the death of the attestator happened on the cross. Right? The real New Testament happened on the cross. Even though we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the New Testament, Jesus Christ lived in the Old Testament. The new agreement for salvation did not occur until after he died. It was his blood that paid the price for our sin, not his appearance. Of course, some scholars will say that he has been appearing before in the past, perhaps in the order of Melchizedek, who knows? Right? But the point is that it was his blood. So you need to be able to ask your question. This statement I am reading, where did he occur? If it is in the New Testament, where did he occur? Is it when Jesus was on earth, before, before he died, after he died, before the Holy Spirit came, right? Which is why I told us we have to be able to answer this question. 
where am I here? And the passage I'm reading, where does it fall? If you don't do that, you will heap on top yourself some of the things that God does not want us to do now in the New Testament. You will carry it and put it on, your, on top yourself simply because it's in the Bible. And Paul wrote to some of them. He said, who bewitched you? Who bewitched you, all you foolish people? That you started with grace and now you now want to go and carry the laws of Moses and put it upon yourself again. Bewitched you. That's what Paul told them. Do you understand what you are believing? Do you understand? Paul was asking them. And I'm asking many people today, do we understand what we actually believe? Do we understand what this Christianity is? Do we understand why Christianity is sweet and the best religion in the world? Do we really understand it? Do we think it's a bunch of do's and don'ts? Then what separates it from Hinduism? What separates it from Buddhism? What separates it from Sikhism? What separates it from Islamism? There are multiple key events and circumstances in the New Testament between which events, note this beginning statement are the same, but the points are different. The other one is between which events or during which circumstance did it occur? The second one is during which events or during which circumstance do you exist? So an event may happen before the birth of Jesus Christ. The circumstance may be come let's return to the Lord for he has turned, he will heal us. The circumstance will be you have robbed me by tithe and offering. This Old Testament. Where are you? I am here. In the red something. I'm in the New Testament. What is happening to me now? That's how you get it. Remember, all of these things are stories about different people and different times of about six to 8,000 years. Some of them have nothing to do with you completely. Nothing to, some of the stories have nothing. This book of Esther has nothing to do with you and I. The book of children of Israel, living Israel, has nothing to do with you and I. Nothing. The Feast of Unliving Bread has nothing to do with you and I. We are not children of Israel. We were never held captive. We were not in Egypt. It has nothing to do with us. Carrying all those things on top of your head simply because it's in the Bible is negating the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Why did Jesus Christ come if we still have to be carrying the load of what Paul himself wrote in the book of Romans as being a text master? Right? The reason is because most times we don't ask ourselves, where am I? So you think you are still in the book of Jonah. You think you are still in, if there's anything, you think you are still in the book of Psalms. We are no longer there. That was an old one. In the sequence of events, that is an old covenant. There is a new one. Understand the new one in the light of the old one. I know where you are. Right? Let's move on. So, in this way of understanding the Bible, we need to understand who is our spokesperson. Who is our spokesperson? For us as Christians, and remember, Gentiles, our spokesperson is Apostle Paul. Let's look at his slides. In Romans chapter 11, verse 13, for I speak to you, Gentiles, Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. I know many people will not have seen this passage before, because one would do not gloss through it, right? because we don't do inductive Bible study. What we do is topical study. Uh, what is the topic for today? Well, the topic is love. We don't pick all the passages that mention love, then come and preach hot someone and move away. But you are taking it out of context. You don't even understand what he's talking about. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. It's written in the Bible. Acts chapter 22, verse 21. And he said unto me, depart. For I, and this was when Paul was talking about his commission. He was giving a record of his commission in Acts chapter 22. He said, and he said unto me, depart. For I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. To reveal his son in me, that I may preach him among the hidden. That's a funny, funny word if you understand the meaning. 
right? If you've been a Christian for a while, you may not understand the meaning. Uh, I've discovered, discussing this topic, I discovered that people who were not Christians before, who became Christian, understand the meaning of the word hidden more than people who were born in Christianity, right? The Jews see themselves as the righteous one and other people are unclean. They are hidden, right? Immediately, I conferred not with the flesh and blood. So again, Paul talking, to reveal his son in me that I may preach him among the hidden. You and I are hidden, according to the Jews. Right? Galatians chapter 2, 7 to 9. But contrawise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, who are the uncircumcised? We, you and I, Gentiles, we are the uncircumcised. Again, you have to understand that the way the gospel sounds to the Jews is different from the way it sounds to the heathen. The Jews, even in two acts of apostle, didn't believe that the heathen could accept Jesus as they were circumcised and still be saved. They had to send emissaries down to Jerusalem to confer with the elders, Peter and others, and there was a debate between Peter and Paul whether the heathen had to be circumcised. You and I, we are the uncircumcised, according to this passage. So I read it again. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. Now, this is New King, uh, this King James Version. Um, let me see. Can we read it from another translation so that it breaks it clearer for us? Right? Because King James has the way sometimes makes things look very, very difficult. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Let's read from one translation. I'm very excited about where we've got into, which is application, because that is the, the main thing of all of this. And I tell you, if you read the Bible and understand it in the uh, this pattern, which is inductive Bible, so which is the pattern that fathers of old were using before, you know, we bastardized um, everything, basically. This was how scriptures were read and interpreted and understood. Galatians chapter 2, let's um, see that passage. From verse 7. This new King James Version. Let me use contemporary English version so we we'll get it. Verse 7. They realized God has sent me with the good news for what? Gentiles, Gentiles, uncircumcision. Right? So I've just cleared that out so that somebody will not be wondering now how can you say uncircumcision is a person? It's talking about a group of people, right? Now, Verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter through the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. Let's go and read again from, um, from that part, right? Verse 8, God who had sent Peter on a mission to the Jews was now using me to preach to the Gentiles. So who is our spokesperson in the Bible? Paul. If you want to understand how you should live your life as a Christian, the doctrine of Christianity in the New Testament, you read more of the letters of Paul. Does that mean that Paul could not and, should and did not evangelize to the Jews? No. Did that mean, conversely, that Peter did not evangelize to the Gentiles? No, in fact, if you understand the sequencing of events here, you will discover that Peter had an encounter, right? Paul, Jesus Christ had earlier told Peter in Acts chapter 1 that John the Baptist baptized with water, but there's going to be baptism of the Spirit. Peter did not understand until when he met Cornelius, and when he preached to Cornelius, while he was preaching, boom, the Holy Spirit came. And Cornelius was baptized in the Holy Spirit and was speaking. And Peter said, and now I remember. Even when Jesus Christ was telling Peter, on the mountain of ascension, Peter still did not understand. 
right? Which is why I said you have to understand these things. Because if you take the way some of the things Peter said before he came in contact with the Gentiles, you preach a wrong doctrine, right? Because it was sequenced. It is a revelation. Somebody's unfolding a story to you. You just stop halfway and started running with it. You never hear the, uh, the, the, the end of the story, right? You get the end of the story, then you can start running. But the Bible says you write the vision and make it very plain. That's the plain. Don't draw um, just half story and start running, right? So the same God who gave Peter what to go and preach to the Jews was the same one that gave Paul what to preach to the Gentiles. Let's look at another one. Now I say that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision. Right? Indeed, Jesus Christ was sent to the Jews. Firstly. And you have to understand that. If you understand this, in fact, the, the gospel the gospels make it very clear. The Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus Christ. You know, I said, look, why should I give the food of the children to the dogs? Jesus Christ rarely spoke to the uncircumcised in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Because he was sent to his own. And who is his own? Even though we try to misinterpret to mean all of us, he was talking about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. He came there first to them. He was, in fact, if you remember where we read in one of those places, the first instruction Jesus Christ gave the 12 disciples that was they should go and preach and they should not preach to anybody that is not a Jew. We read it here, right? Then later on, he now expanded it. Right, we have to understand how the how the gospel unfolded itself. Right, Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision. Why is the Jews for the truth of God? However, look at verse sixteen. If you read, 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 I don't have the time. That I should be the minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. So Paul is to the Gentiles, and again, remember there are three people. Right now. So in Matthew 10, Jesus Christ told them, don't go to the Gentiles, only to the lost sheep of Israel. Mm -hmm. Right? And like, like I say, he did, he did minister to the Gentiles, um, even by exception. Right? The bulk of our doctrines should therefore be formed from the letters of Paul. Mm -hmm. Right? There are transitions in the Bible. There are seasons in the Bible. But, but Paul was the one that got the ministry to the Gentiles. And we are Gentiles. We must remember that Right Again, am I saying don't read the Old Testament? No. Am I saying don't read other things? No. Remember, we read the types of interpretation, and we'll get to that. Right, there are three most voluminous New Testament writers. Right, Three most voluminous New Testament writers. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John 2, and the Book of Revelation. Luke wrote the Book of Acts and Luke. Only two. But those two books, powerful. We didn't have known of Pentecost and many other things without Bro Luke, right? And Luke is a physician. Now, Paul wrote Romans, first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, right? He wrote those books. Now, some people think that he wrote the book of Hebrews. There's a debate, but it doesn't really matter right now. But one thing I know is that all the writings of the, all the books that Paul wrote starts with Paul. <laughs> right? And Hebrews did not start with Paul. Let's look at that quickly. Okay. So let's go to Romans, the book of Romans. Chapter one from Paul. Let's go to King James Version or New King James Version, the one that we know very well. Okay. Right? Paul is servant of Jesus Christ. That's Romans. First Corinthians, chapter 1. Paul. Second Corinthians, chapter 1. Paul. Yep. What else again? Galatians, chapter 1. Paul. Let's jump some. Paul, you see one thirty first going. First Thessalonians, chapter 1. Paul. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. No Paul. So there's a debate who wrote the book of Hebrews. But again, it is not important for the purpose of this video. It may be important in another time. 
we don't need it for this video. Now we need to think about who these people are and what they wrote, right? If you go through Bible history and church history, you understand that from Acts chapter 13, when Paul became the spokesman of the Gentiles, he, he began to take control of the narrative of the New Testament writings, right? In fact, Paul and Peter didn't come up again after Acts chapter 15. You don't hear from Peter again. Luke travels with the apostle Paul in the later part of the book of Acts. The accounts that we read in the book of Luke and Acts were written after the events in the book of Acts have occurred. So if you heard me very well, what you read, and you read it between the lines, what you'll be hearing me say is that Luke was heavily influenced by Apostle Paul, right? Um, when John wrote the book of John, he started writing his book in the um, late 80s of the first century. The book of John is the last of the epistles. The book of John, among Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of John is the last. In fact, people who debate the authenticity and the veracity of the New Testament document, they don't like the book of John. And they try to discredit the book of John by saying that it was written later. Therefore, the writer had time to doctor some things. Because if you take away the book of John from the Bible, it becomes very, very difficult to prove that Jesus Christ is God. It becomes very difficult. If, if, for, for an average Christian, if you want to prove that Jesus Christ is God, the book of John is the go place. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word. I mean, just check it. Right? The book of John. So they try to discredit it. But when we get into um, apologetics and we start discussing with them, we throw them away because, I mean, there was no written document about Muhammad until after like one, 200 and something years after he had. The book of John was, was written when eyewitnesses, John himself was an eyewitness. Other eyewitnesses were around or people who had relationship with eyewitnesses, they were around when Paul, John was writing the, the book of John. Right, so he can't discredit it because he himself is an eyewitness. There was no eyewitness to the to um, to the to the writings of Muhammad or, or to the Quran. There's no eyewitness. Everybody had died. Their children had died. Their grandchildren had died. Their great grandchildren had died before a document was written. <laughs> right, so they can't even bring that. But of course, if you don't know, they bamboozle us and they still convert some Christians um, with that. Now, when John started writing his book in the mid late eighties, he writes the Gospel of John. First, the second, and third John, and the book of Revelation. By the time John was writing, Paul was already beheaded at around 64 AD. Right? So there's every likelihood that John had all of Paul's writing in front of him. So he is now taking his eyewitness accounts of being with Jesus, experiencing the many events he had with Jesus, and the experiences he went through the book of Acts. Through his personal growth in the Lord and revelations given to Paul, he takes all that information and he, and of course, the temple was destroyed. He saw all of those things and Jesus Christ predicted it. He knew that this thing is real. This man is actually true. Besides the fact that I saw him raising up from death, he predicted the destruction of the temple and it occurred. Paul, John knew. John is the, the book of John is the only epistle that was written after the destruction of the temple. Right? So John knew all of this. And that's why if you read the book of John, he stated this clearly. I am writing this thing so that you will know. Remember when we were looking at inductive Bible study, we said you have to check why is the person writing it. John was very proposed for writing the book of John. If you read, I remember those days when we, when I gave my life to Christ and many other young people give their life to Christ. The first book they tell us to go and read is the book of John. Because it's not as confusing as Matthew, Mark, and he tries to arrange things orderly, right? He was writing, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been that orderly if he wrote much, much, much earlier. But that still does not discredit him. He understood the essence of 
Many things that Peter did not understand, many things that Mark did not understand, many things that Matthew did not understand, because they began to understand it later on. Jesus Christ told them many things that they didn't understand. Right? If you read the book of John, it will mention that, and Jesus Christ told them that he was going to do something, the Holy Spirit was going to do something, but they did not understand because the Holy Spirit had not yet. You get the gist. Right? So what I'm saying this is that I want us to understand how the Bible came about. Many of us have this mystical belief about the Bible that the Bible just dropped, like the Quran, they believe the Quran just dropped from heaven. Right? And therefore the Quran is eternal. That's why when you tear it and many things, they, they get they go, they get all, all, uh, all agitated. The Bible is not like that. People wrote it by inspiration. Right? You need to understand that people wrote the Bible. Now let's proceed to begin to look at our interpretations. Right, so the first we are going to look at is historic application. Right? The historic application, remember we say, we defined historic application uh, earlier. We say it's a narrative or instruction directed or regarding historic entities. For example, the story of Gideon. It is something, what Gideon did, going to destroy the Baal, the shrine of um, Baal, is a story for him. If you like, stand up, go to your village and destroy their shrine. Like, I don't know if you, some of you are fooling. There is one man just two months ago in one village, somewhere in Wari or Ekuma or somewhere around that side. He went and there is one particular snake that they, they worship. He went to kill the snake and, and they just saw him carrying pot up and down, preparing a yam, doing, they didn't know that it was their God that the man ate. It was a serious police issue. If some of you don't know about it, the, <laughs> the man had to go and bury the shrine with the, 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 the snake. He did ceremony for the snake. The pastor, he did, they, you should, if God did not give his express direction, you say because Gideon destroyed one shrine and you go to destroy shrine, you're on your own. The repercussions will come. God delivered Gideon. His father was there and told them, if God did not send you, don't go and do it. Is a specific instruction to give you. Right? Look at Job chapter 12, verse 16. The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. Just check it. I'm trying to do what many of our preachers do these days. They just pick a passage out of context and start teaching it. I can preach a powerful sermon to let you know that robbers will prosper and that they prove and they that provoke God, they, that they are very secure. And that in whose and God, and in whose hand God bringeth abundance, God gives them abundance. But you and I know if you read this passage in context, you discover that Job was being sarcastic here when he was talking to his friends. What he said is not true. But this account is a true expression of what Job said. So two weeks ago when I said that the Bible is true unless where it is not true. It looked like one was saying heresy, right? And I gave us the, express, the story of that king that many, many um, prophets came and said, go, you, you, you will prosper. Then the true prophet came and said, go, you will prosper. And the king said, tell me the truth. I said, well, if you go, you will not prosper. And I dead body will carry come. Right? He lied to them. What he said is not the truth. But the Bible account of that passage is true. So if you don't pick a passage in context, you can just take anything and then start running with it. And you could preach heresy. Because again, the tabernacles of robbers do not prosper. And anybody who provokes God is not secure. And God will not make their hand to have abundance. It's pure fallacy. He was being sarcastic. This is a historic application, meaning that this is just telling you what happened. It doesn't mean because it's the Bible, anything God's word, go and do it, verbatim, irony. Sorry, irony is irony. I remember that joke. So, it doesn't mean you should take it verbatim. So please, when we are reading the Bible, get the context. Remember that preacher that I showed us? 
and I think I still played it last week. And people are saying that look, you are you only you have three aeroplane, only, only you have three aeroplane. Yeah, you not leaving the gospel and becoming too prosperous. He now went to the book of Psalm to go and pick a passage, and that passage was talking about the foolishness of the of of of, of uh, 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 the riches of the fool. He was appropriating it to himself. Unfortunately, he told his wife to read it in Amplified. And when they read, the wife read it in Amplified, the thing was fired. He now had to use um, something to now twist it and now balance the sermon. There was nothing to balance about the wrong context. So just going to the Bible, closing your eye and do tinin it, and just pick one. And say, okay, this is what God is saying for me today. That's not how to read God is saying for me today. That's not to read Bible. God may do that to you once or twice. But if you continue doing that, you will soon point at another place and say, and Judas hang himself. You say, no, this one is not talking to me. When you do it again and do the next one, whatever I want to go and do, go and do quickly. You will soon point to something like that. Right? That's not how to read the Bible. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopa wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. This is a historic application. It's just telling you history. It doesn't mean you should go and make wood, um, uh, make an ark now. Right? The command is for those people it was sent to, not for us. It becomes stupid and foolish of us to just say, because it is in the Bible, anything in the Bible is God's word, and you try to apply it to yourself. It's, telling, it's simply telling you a story. So I told us one time in my church, we used to have a program called Audience with the King, and somebody came and said, what is the spiritual significance of the transfiguration? And my answer was, there is no spiritual significance of transfiguration. The transfiguration is simply the transfiguration. It was just a story telling us what happened. There is not like, what is the significance of the three hours of darkness after Jesus Christ? There is no significance. Three hours of darkness is three hours of darkness. Simple. The Bible didn't tell us that there was one special thing added to that story. It's just it's a story. We're just telling us a story. There is no hidden, one hidden gem that you have to turn the Bible and, and snap it and look at the negative of what you snap before you see the meaning. You can infer, but now you are now running in error of adding to the Bible or saying something that may be debatable because somebody may infer differently. And truth can only be one. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 10. And Elisha sent a message unto him, Naaman, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and that shall be clear. This is historic application. He just telling us a story. What we can do here is we can learn practically. Remember the other thing. We can learn, obey God, no matter even if it doesn't make sense. We can learn that. But because somebody has um, pimples, he has a, um, what do they call it? Um, um, rashes, or what is that sickness that I normally have that will be drawing on people's body? I've forgotten the name. Misus. You now start jumping inside one river near your place. Nothing will happen. You will contaminate your, your skin and you can get different, get um, even worse. The disease can get worse. So, because this is the Bible, doesn't mean you should just go and do it. You have to understand where are you? Where are you? Are you in this place? No, this is an Old Testament telling you a story. This thing doesn't concern you. This thing is Elisha and Nehemiah. What is all? Maybe you add God and the lady, the small girl that sent Nehemiah. What is all? Inside the story, this concerns you at all. You can read it and now learn what is the moral of the story. Not that it has anything to do with you. And that is Old Testament. Let's look at New Testament. Right? Matthew chapter 10, 5 to 6. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus was sending his 12 disciples to go and preach. And he told them not to teach to preach to any Gentile or even Samaritan. This is also a historic application. This was for just that time. Because later on, Jesus Christ told us that we shall be witnesses unto him from Jerusalem and Judea. And Judea and Samaria, and all to the uttermost part of the earth. It's Jesus Christ, the same mount. So you need to understand, 
Because Jesus Christ said something in the New Testament, New Testament, quote and off quote, that is Old Testament inside the New Testament writings, doesn't mean it has become a doctrine. Some Bibles have the words of Jesus in red. Many of the words of Jesus in red, we are still addressing Old Testament doctrines. Because Jesus Christ mentioned, uh, what do you call it, Sabbath, does not mean we should be doing Sabbath. Because Jesus Christ mentioned tight, does not necessarily mean we should be tightening. Because Jesus Christ um, tended to agree with the Pharisees when they came to him and said, if one woman marry a, 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 a man and the man died, then he now marry the second one and the man died and he now marry the third one, up to the seventh one. Does he mean that Jesus Christ has given us a doctrine that I agree if a, the wife of a senior brother died, the younger brother should go and marry that child. Even though it is said in the New Testament, even though it was said by Jesus, it doesn't mean we should go and do it. It's not a doctrinal thing. We must understand these things clearly. Because many times we mumble all of those things and you see Christianity that should be sweet and loving and moving. We mumble everything and carry big bodies and put it upon our head. What God did not send us. This is his story. This is just a story. We are supposed to all read us. Ah, you know, Jesus Christ, he came. He didn't even do it. How many Samaritans did Jesus Christ talk to? How many? These are these. How many Jews did he try to reach? Jesus Christ even practiced their ceremonies, the last of which was the Passover, which actually started from Egypt on the night of their departure. Jesus Christ practiced the feast of living bread. He practiced the feast of tents with them, right? In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, I say, that it is good for a man to be sold. Hey, this one has caused a lot of trouble on internet lately, where people are saying whether it is good for a man to marry, a good no, a good for a man to marry. One very big man of God has even said it is good for people to have premarital sex because of this passage. We close here. We still have a long way to go. Um, we've got prophetic application and blah blah blah. But again, we can't finish it. But I will read. I will take us to this first Corinthians chapter 7, verse 26, and then we'll look at it. Right? This historic application of what is that the very first one? And that's where we can end for today. But let's go to historic application, first Corinthians chapter 7, um, verse 26. So check first Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7. Again. <clears throat> Let's read it from contemporary, just for the purpose of uh, breaking down the grammar. If you check, we're talking about questions about marriage, right? And we're going to first Corinthians 7, verse 26. Now, let's look at the unmarried people. I do not know anything the Lord said about people who are never been married, right? So in Kim Jong's version, he puts it like, look, let's do a parallel. Let's do a parallel. So in Kim Jong's version, he said, he said in verse 25, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord. So there are some things that Paul wrote, even though they are in the Bible, they were Paul's personal view. But now we've imposed it on people like they were his, they have God's word. And Paul was very clear. In more than one instance, he said, this is my view. The Holy Spirit did not tell me, this is my view. Paul's view is not God's view. We can discard those if they are debatable. We can at least discard them. At least they are debatable. The ones that are not God's, Paul's view that were revealed to him. He said, neither flesh or blood, that he did not get it from flesh or blood. Paul wrote it, we read the passage, right? He said, I do not know anything the Lord said about people who have never been married. But I'll tell you what I think, and you can trust me because the Lord has treated me with kindness. We are now going through hard times. And I think it's best for you to stay as you are. 
If you are married, stay married. If you are not married, don't get married. It isn't wrong to marry, even if you have never been married before. But those who marry, we have lots of trouble. And I want to protect you from this. My friends, what I mean is the Lord will soon come. And it won't matter if you are married or not. It will be the same if you are crying or laughing. Or if you are buying or are completely broke. It won't make any difference how much good you are getting from this world. Or how much you like. If you read from King James Version, it's more confusing. Right? People have turned it. Some people right now are, have circumcised themselves. Some people have decided not to be getting married. Some congregations and some sects have decided that for you to worship God very well, you have to be unmarried and they become monks or nuns. For a passage that was just Paul's view, and if you read church history and you check when the probable date of when 1 Corinthians was written, it was around Acts 23, shortly before Paul gave his last testament before he was beheaded. I could be wrong, but it is very much that Paul is saying, look, we are passing through tough times. We need to just face this gospel and do it. Our life is at risk. Anything can happen. It could be. The Bible didn't tell us what it was. So at best, we can all infer. It could be. But this thing was talking to a group of people at that time. It's historic. It's not a doctrine. They will start telling people, don't get married. Like some people are doing now. That's why I said, when you are reading the Bible, you need to know, where are you? Who was this passage written to? Under what circumstances? Where are you inside this picture? Right? I want to thank all of us for coming today.